Margie. Thank you to the worship team. Um, thank you to Tom and Jim. I'm not Dave, for those who have been around for a while. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Michael. I am the associate pastor of youth and discipleship. Um, really, that just means I'm a youth pastor, and I will try my hardest to be mature. No, no promises. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to remind you, Margie mentioned it, but it's, it's something that's really on our hearts. If you are here right now sitting here, we want you guys to stick around for the annual meeting afterwards. In fact, we made it so easy for you to do that, that at the end of the service, you don't even have to go anywhere. You can just stick around. Now, some of you are going to be annoyed because I'm going to be talking about bread a lot in this, in this message. And if you've read ahead, you know why. But that's going to make you hungry. It's going to make your stomachs grumble. And so you're going to want to want to dip really fast so that you can go eat. Stick around. Because if you stick around for the annual meeting, then we're all going to go downstairs. And we're going to eat together with a potluck. And the annual meeting is a really good time. It's my first annual meeting with, with Crosspoint. So I'm really excited to see what it looks like. Apparently, I'm supposed to say some things. I don't know what that's going to look like. But um, it's an opportunity to see the budget, right? We want to be really financially transparent for what we do in this ministry that, that we as a church body do in this ministry. Um, there are going to be uh, updates on different ministry events and, and uh, plans and things like that. So it's super important that you guys join us so you can ask questions, you can be an active part of this body. Because if you don't, Dave is going to run rampant and nobody wants that, right? He's going to end up with... He's going to end up with all of us in, like, blow-up costumes and things. Like, it's going to be a thing. Um, so please stick around for the annual meeting and then the potluck afterwards. Um, we have been going through the Gospel of John. And it has been, I don't know about you guys, it has been an absolute blessing to my soul. It has been hard at times. It has been encouraging. It has been convicting because the Gospel of John isn't, isn't written to be easy. In fact, we know what the Gospel of John is written for. We've been talking about this, this verse. We see it all the way out in, verse, uh, in chapter 20, where John tells us that these things have been written so that you, that's us sitting here, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Most of us don't fully understand that. And some days even, we might understand it better than others. I certainly go through seasons where I don't fully appreciate the life that Jesus came to provide. I get wrapped up in the things of this world, the things that are right in front of me that feel so much bigger than the God of the universe. How crazy is that to think that there are things that might be bigger than the God of the universe. <laughs> Can't get much bigger than that. Last week, we, we took a look at this really special moment, this miraculous moment where Jesus declared for his disciples his mastery over all of creation as he, and Dave took us to Job 9, 8, as he trampled the waves and walked on the water to them. Today, we're going to be in John chapter 6, starting in verse 22, we're going to be looking at the next morning. And now for, two, for those of you who were here two weeks ago, two weeks ago we saw the, the feeding of the more than 5,000, but it's labeled in a, lot of Bi in a lot of Bibles as the feeding of the 5,000. And I want you to understand that this, what we're going to talk about today, didn't happen two weeks after that feeding. It happened the next morning. The next morning. The next morning. I just... I, that's going to be super important, but the next morning, all right? So if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to John chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 22. If you have a device, you can scroll there. Um, and I just want to read this passage to you. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. And that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So, 
when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do then to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I have said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's a, a cruel irony to the fact that <laughs> one of my challenges to myself as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a bringer of the word, is to speak less quickly. And there's this cruel irony to the fact that Dave got like six verses to talk about last week, and I have 20, okay? <laughs> but if we look at this, there's this series of questions that are happening. And there's this social discourse happening, and Jesus is answering these questions. And if you read it, he's not answering them differently. And I want you guys to notice that a lot of us go to Jesus and we'll ask questions and we'll think that we're being tricky and we're asking them in different ways. And Jesus' answer is always the same thing. It's always come to me. Always come to me. Right? Some of us, we, we like to often liken ourselves to the disciples. Right? We think, well, we're the ones who are in the boat, maybe. We're, we're the ones who are following Jesus. Like, maybe we don't always understand what he's, but we're, we're the ones who are with him. Right? But more often than not, we're this crowd of people. We're this, this group of people who are seeking him for maybe a wrong reason, or maybe just not the, the full reason. I imagine in this scene, you know, this is a really narrative scene, and I imagine dawn breaking over the horizon, and this group of people who had camped out on this hillside, on this mountain sign, you know, they, they start waking each other up, they get some of the sleep out of their eyes, maybe some of you need to get some of the sleep out of your eyes still, and they start looking around because their stomachs are grumbling. And they know that there was a guy who just fed all of them the night before. And I imagine them looking going, where did he go? And if you remember that story, there were 12 baskets left at the end filled with bread. Now, the story doesn't tell us that they didn't see it. It doesn't say that they did see it. But I feel, if, I, if I'm just putting myself in this place, I think that what I do with Jesus is I say, okay, that's great. That's nice. I, I remember that blessing. Where is he, though? I don't remember the goodness. And we see that they start looking for Jesus. They remember that he didn't leave with the disciples, so he must be around, they think, but they can't find him. So they go off to Capernaum in search of him. Their stomach's grumbling. Maybe some of them are a little overdramatic, like some of us before we've had our morning coffee. Oh, I just don't know how I'm going to go on. And they find him. They cross the sea and they find him. And I can't, can't help but to imagine, they expected him on the side that they were on. They 
go to the other side of the sea, and they find him there, and there's this question, and I, I hear confusion. I hear um, maybe, maybe some awe, but really, I think I hear confusion. Right? Rabbi, when did you come here? See, we, we know that you can provide the things for us that we want. We've been trying to keep an eye on you. When did you, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. Now this, this is him cutting to their heart. Because if you remember, the, when that crowd went out to find Jesus in the first place, it said that they went to go follow him because he had been doing signs and healing people. But he's saying, nah, that's not why you're following me. Right? You, you don't follow me because you saw signs. You, you follow me because you ate your fill of the loaves. You're following me for what I can do for you in this moment, but you're missing the point of those signs that you're claiming that you're coming to me for. And so many of us, this is what we do. We wake up in the morning and we say, you know what, I'm going to choose Jesus today because Jesus will get me that raise. Jesus will get me that job. Jesus will get me that girlfriend or that boyfriend or into that school. And maybe there's good, thi there's good things to pray for. There's good things that Jesus gives us. Where, and Margie alluded to some of it in her, in her um, talk where we might say, Jesus will give me that healing. That disease that I've been fighting. That cancer that I have. Jesus is telling them, that's not why you come to me. God blesses, uh, promises, promises us blessing beyond measure, but he doesn't promise it necessarily right now. And we can't go to Jesus simply because we say, well, you fed me yesterday. We go to him because he is the son of man, because he is the one who gives us food that goes beyond all of these temporal things. And here's today's point. Jesus is calling you into his kingdom and out of your own. Right? He's calling you into his kingdom and out of your own. <laughs> You're seeking me not because you saw signs you ate your fill of loaves. And Jesus is poking at their theology. He's poking at their expectation of the Messiah. He says, don't work for the food that perishes. If you eat bread, if you get that job, if you get money, if you are healed, you're still gonna die. Physically. That bread spoils. Work labor for, go to the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. And the Son of Man language is important. Dave, a couple weeks ago, when he started talking about this, talked about how this is a reference to, to Jesus as the better king. This Son of Man language is, that, is language that if they were familiar with their Old Testament scripture, which we're going to see in a moment that they maybe weren't as familiar as they thought that they were, but if they were familiar with their Old Testament scripture, they would recognize what was happening. Daniel 7 is this reference. And as Daniel in his visions uh, comes and stands before the throne with the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, he says, I saw in the night visions. This is Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And here's the, here's the thing, ready? And to him, to this son of man, was given dominion, and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is calling you out of your kingdom into his. His is everlasting. It will never perish. And this is not 
this is not Jesus saying, okay, listen, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to trust me so much that I don't want you to ever buy food or eat breakfast again. He's not saying that. God has blessed you. He has given you a physical body that is meant to be a, an image of him. You are image bearers. That's not what he's saying. So you can still have your breakfast and your second breakfast and afternoon tea and all of those things. No Lord of the Rings fans? Come on now. <laughs> this is not a call to not pray for healing. This is not a call to not ask him for those things that you need. It's a call to not ask on him only because you want those things. It's a call out of your kingdom, out of your self-sovereignty and into his. This food, this food of eternal life, it comes from Jesus, right? The Son of Man gives this to you. And he alone can do it because on him, God has set, God the Father has set his seal. Seals were used to determine authority, right? Validity. He's stating over and over again, listen to what I'm saying, you Jewish people. Listen to what I'm saying, Crosspoint Church. I am the Son of Man who wants to give you the food that endures to eternal life. And they say to him, they say to him, right, what must we do then to be doing the works of God? So I think, I want you guys to imagine, if you will, I'm going to talk about food a little bit. I want you guys to imagine that you walk into a cafeteria, all right, in this cafeteria, you look at the serving, and it's like the best food that you've ever had. I want you to call to mind maybe that, that delicious porterhouse steak that, you, that sits in your memory that makes your taste buds water. Maybe it's a perfectly grilled salmon. Maybe that really delicious pho or some curry. And you walk in, and that's sitting there, and you are handed a tray, and you're told this tray belongs to you. And then you walk up, but you're looking at your tray, and you notice there's a crack in your tray. Not all the way through, but there's a crack. You say, well, I can't eat this. Uh, this, this. This isn't a perfect, pristine tray. Or maybe, maybe it's, it has three of those, like, compartments on the tray. But you're like, no, 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 I need two of those. Or I need four. Right? Or maybe, maybe the tray is blue, and you're like, ah, oh, no, I really want it to be purple. Or I really want it to be green. And so you walk up to the one serving the food and you say, I can't take the food because this tray isn't the tray that I want. And imagine this server smiling at you saying, it will hold the food. It will hold the nourishment. And, and look, there's food abundant. We'll never run out here. Take the food. And you stand there saying, I, I can't. Until you give me the tray the way that I want, I can't. And this is what we do with Jesus all the time. We go, Jesus, I'm not going to take your food until you've, until you've done this thing for me. Until you fix this crack. Until you fix the number of compartments. And so Jesus is saying, I give you that food. And then they do this thing and they say, right, they say, what must we do to do the works of God? So they don't even view it as a cafeteria that they can walk into. They view it as a speakeasy. Some of you are younger and you don't know what a speakeasy is. So a speakeasy is a restaurant or a place that you go to, but you have to know the password or you have to know the secret switch. And if you don't know those things, some of them will make you do, you know, silly dances or things, and you don't realize that there's cameras pointing at you, and the restaurant inside is all watching you and laughing at you and making you feel really embarrassed about yourself. And I'm definitely only speaking hypothetically. It's never happened to me. <laughs> but they, they say, Jesus, what is, what is the thing that we need to do to get access to the restaurant? And Jesus is saying, I'm here. Come, to the, come into the cafeteria. I'm here to give you this food. Come up as often as you need to fill yourselves with the food of eternal life. This is this, like, beautiful statement of the gospel. 
what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus answers them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That's radical. That's radical even for us today. So we live in a world where we're told if you don't perform, if you don't do things a certain way, you don't deserve X, Y, Z. Jesus is saying, you can't perform. You have to believe. Believe in him who sent me. They misunderstand what he's saying. Like, surely it can't be so easy as you giving this to us. And he's just saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Like, this is, it's that, it's that simple. And yet we constantly want to look at our trays. We want to find the speakeasy password or switch. And I just want to ask you, if you're sitting here, like, have, have, you, have you done this yet? Have you believed in him who God sent to bring salvation? Have you, have you set your eyes on Jesus? Scripture tells us that by grace, we're saved through faith. This is not our own doing. It's a gift of God. And who is the gift giver? Jesus, the Son of Man. Do you hear him calling you to his kingdom? Do you hear him calling you to eternal life, to him, to believe in him? Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God isn't asking you to go through a series of hoops to receive eternal life in his name. Communion isn't the thing that brings you eternal life in his name. Baptism isn't the thing that brings you eternal life in his name. Knowing enough scripture verses isn't the thing that brings you to eternal life in his name. Those are all good things, by the way. But those aren't the things that save. Those aren't the things that bring life abundant. He's asking not for you to jump through hoops. He's asking for you. He's asking for you. Tim, Timothy Keller, who passed away this week, if you're, if you're familiar with him, says the gospel is this. We, I, are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. He's calling to you through his word to let go of these preconceptions that we have about what has to be done or has to be accomplished in order to meet Jesus. Come and see the author of your salvation. No password or secret switch needed. Jesus is calling you into his kingdom, into his presence. Will you accept the bread of life that the Son of Man gives? And notice the response of these people. Right? This is the work of God, he says, that you believe in him. They say, okay, well, um, then what, what do you do? What sign do you do so that we may believe? This is the morning after, the morning after he just fed thousands of people on five loaves of bread and two fish. What sign will you do, they ask? How nearsighted are we? How short-sighted are we? They left behind the reminder of his blessing, of his provision, to go and find him for the next thing. What sign do you do? And remember, they're not there for signs, right? Jesus has already called this out for them. I'll call this out in them. They're not there for signs. But they say, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What, what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. And it's important to note, this is where they quote scripture just a little, a little, a little farther. Because what they're doing here is they're connecting Jesus to this Moses prophet figure. And they mistakenly are saying that Moses is the one who gave them the bread from heaven. But when you read those Old Testament scriptures, it's God bringing the manna. 
and is written as such. So they're misquoting scripture. But they're still so focused on the physical, the temporal, the immediate. Moses gave us manna, what are you going to do? Sometimes we see and remember the way that God has blessed others. My parents had this happen. My siblings, my friends, maybe even me a month or so ago, whatever it is. We say, well, God, I need that blessing again. I need you to do that again. And then, then I'll believe in you. Then we'll, be, then we'll be square. And yet so often, we just refuse to look and remember what he has done. And so Jesus, Jesus corrects our theology and theirs at the same time. He says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now this is a dramatic correction. Have any of you ever had your theology corrected? Oh, come on. Everybody's hands should be up. We've all gotten it wrong. We've all gotten it wrong, right? Because, and it is not, it is not necessarily fun. It isn't pleasant, right? And he's rebuking them through this all. And it's a dramatic correction because first they had to be reminded that Moses, in fact, was a human, which means he was a sinner. And so it wasn't him who gave the manna. It was God. First he had to correct that. But then he says this thing, and I want you to remember, if you don't know the story of the manna in the wilderness, go read it. It's, it's cool and crazy and kind of weird sometimes. But listen, manna was a gift from God to the Israelites alone. They were the only group of people who got the manna. And every day God would provide this manna, this bread of short-term life. And they had to collect just what they needed because at the end of the day, if they collected beyond that, it would wither. It would, it would be destroyed. And so they would collect just what they needed for the day. An exception being, on Friday, they would collect two days' worth so that they didn't have to collect again on the Sabbath. But it was this statement over and over again that God provides for his people. But it was for the Israelites alone. And yet, and yet, Jesus, this bread of life that comes down once and for all, the work is finished on this side of the, of the story. He gives life to the world. Our God is a missional God. He never created us to not be in his presence. That is what he wants us to do. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator, and he wants you to be in his presence. He wants you to believe in the one who he sent, the son of man, Jesus. The bread of life isn't a physical, tangible bread. It's a person. The bread of life is he who comes down from heaven. The bread of life is Jesus. So we need in our lives daily, sometimes hourly, minute by minute, we need to look away from, from the things that God is doing that are good in other people's lives as, as things to attain to. God doesn't call you to a set of circumstances. He calls you to himself. And there are things that we would say are fundamentally good, morally good, but these are not the things that we're called to initially. Those are the things that follow our calling to Jesus. Jesus is calling you to his kingdom and out of your own. And so this group of people, they say, sir, give us this bread always. This is really similar to the woman at the well story. I don't know if you remember from all those weeks ago, but as Jesus explained to her that there was the fount of water that wells up to the wellspring of life, her response is, give me this water of eternal life so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. 
he's missing the point. He's not talking about physical bread, spiritual. You are spiritual beings, right? You have a body and you have a soul. And just like the woman at the well, this crowd is still missing the point. Sir, give us this bread always. That sounds great. Never having to go hunting for food. Give us this bread always. Are you missing the point? Are you missing the point? Jesus is saying to them, you aren't here for true spiritual fulfillment, right? You're here for materialism. He's rebuking them. He's instructing them that God has purposed them to believe in him. He's corrected their theology, right? He's pointing to the true bread of God being the one who comes from heaven to bring life to the world. And then starting in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I, Jesus, am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In case you're curious, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And in case that's not clear enough for you, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. When we go to a cafeteria or a speakeasy or the bookstore or Amazon, right, we may not get the thing that we want. Right? The restaurant might be full. Maybe they got closed for health code violations, right? Amazon might be out of stock on a thing. The bookstore might not have the book that you want. There are a few things that are more tragic than not having the book that you want. <laughs> got some nerds in this group. I like it. <laughs> but when we go to our Savior, Jesus, we can be assured of his capacity for each one of us, for each one of you. All, it says, all, not most, all that the Father gives will come to me. Your relationship with Jesus, with the Son of Man, your chance to have life abundantly in him and through him is assured when you come to him. Whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, he says. Some of you need to remember that. Some of you spend, you like, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but does Jesus love me? Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Why do you, why, why does Jesus want you to leave your kingdom and join his? Because he doesn't want to ever cast you out. And listen, you're going to leave your kingdom at some point. Because you're going to die a physical death. One-to-one -one ratio on that. Right? Unless Jesus comes back before you pass away, you are going to experience a temporal, physical death. You are leaving your kingdom one way or another. But you don't need to leave Jesus. You don't need to leave God. You are called to a person called to Jesus. God made flesh, the Alpha and the Omega, wonderful counselor, mighty king, prince of peace, and the author of your salvation. And in case this group of Jews that he's speaking to, and in case these people in cross point right now and watching online aren't getting it, he keeps reminding us over and over again who he is. He says, I will raise them up on the last day. You know who has resurrection power? God. You know who breathes life into dust? God. You know who alone can redeem life through death? God. He's reminding 
them and us over and over again. I and the Father are one. The Son of Man has been given dominion and authority. Leave your kingdom and come to mine. It's a better kingdom. And no matter what temporal things you have going on right now, no matter the suffering, and there is real suffering because all of creation is still groaning under the weight of sin, but no matter what suffering you are experiencing, no matter how overburdened you feel, no matter what pain you're experiencing, the exhaustion, confusion, loneliness, if you come to Jesus, you will have eternity in his presence. Another Tim Keller quote, all death can do to Christians is make their lives infinitely better. Jesus is calling you to his kingdom and out of your own. He's calling you to an eternal kingdom. God has grace abundant for sinners. He overflows with grace. But Jesus gives us a warning in this section too, right? Verse 36, right? I said to you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. What about you? Have you seen Jesus, but you refuse to believe? Have you seen people's lives changed, the testimonies, the women at the wells that we know? don't believe we're going to see next week because we're going to finish this passage next week but we're going to see next week that most of this group don't believe in fact the passage says that the that all of this causes the jewish people who are listening to him to grumble to murmur they're getting anxious and uncomfortable They don't like this. They like their self-sovereignty. Some of you, you're grumbling. You're murmuring. Because you like your self-sovereignty too. I certainly like my self-sovereignty. In the U.S., self-sovereignty is a, a virtue to attain to. But you're not called to the United States. You're not called to be a Republican or a Democrat. You're called to a monarchy. And more importantly, I'm going to do this specifically for Tom Douglas, you are called to a theocracy. Because the ruler of your lives should be God. Because then, then you will leave a life that is going to fade away and you will find yourself living within your true purpose to glorify your creator. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Deuteronomy. Jesus himself uses this when Satan is tempting him in the wilderness. But how about you? Are you trying to live on bread alone? Are you trying to live on the things of this world? Are you trying to live and control your finances in such a way that you never have to worry about anything? Are you trying to control your health to such a degree that in some ways it might make you more unhealthy as anxiety stirs up? Are you trying to live by bread alone or are you trying to live by the word from the mouth of the Lord? Behold, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the way, the truth, the life, the word of God made flesh, and come to him who gives life abundantly in his name. Jesus is calling you to his kingdom and out of your own. Are you going to answer that call? Will you pray with me? Father, we praise you for the good things that you have done. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you came down in the flesh and dwelt among us. 
Thank you that you give us your word. Lord, I pray for all who are here, whether somebody who has believed for their entire life in you or those who haven't yet. And I pray that we would believe in you more frequently, that we wouldn't lose sight of you, that we would leave our kingdoms and that we would come into your presence in your kingdom, Lord, that we would nourish ourselves with the bread of life that you offer. Father, I thank you for this time together. Change our hearts. Change our souls. Make us more Christ-like in all we do by your power. And it's in the mighty, wonderful, eternal name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to take communion together. And... And when we do this, we're going to do it a little bit different. We're going to have you walk up and take the elements. And this is a way of modeling this idea. Are you going to come to the bread of life? Are you going to come to Jesus? This isn't intended to pressure you. In fact, I don't want you to, <laughs> to come and take these elements if you, if you don't know him yet. We're going to come, and I want you to take the elements, and I want you to head back to your seats. And I want you to spend some time reflecting. Pray. Talk to the Lord. Because this is a symbolic representation of an eternal truth. That Jesus came to be the bread of eternal life. And when you are ready on your own time, take the elements. Lauren is going to be playing music for us. We won't take them all at the same time. As you feel ready and led, you take the elements. And for those of you who are sitting here, maybe thinking, I've never, I've never answered that call. I've never answered the call into his kingdom. Maybe today's your day. Maybe today's the day that you stop saying, I've seen, but I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to ask for a perfect life filled with no pain and no difficulty and no suffering, but I'm going to ask for a life filled with the presence of the perfect God. For this is my will, he said, or this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes should have eternal life. And if that's you, if you want to make that decision to move into his presence today, take the elements and then come and talk to me and I'd love to pray with you. Let's remember the point of all of this, the point of the thing that we do, of this thing that we do, the symbolic and communal declaration that Jesus is the Lord and is the bread of life. Let's leave our kingdoms together. As you're ready, you can come up and receive the elements.